Hello and welcome everyone to today's digital live event, Cretech Talks, the evolving dynamics of e-commerce. My name is Ash Gonzandia, Chief Intelligence Officer here at Cretech, and I'm excited to be your host today. In a few minutes, we will hear from the most insightful and active leaders in commercial real estate, supply chain, and logistics as they discuss their perspectives on the impact of the pandemic on our industry and e-commerce. While we're waiting for everyone to log into their digital seats, I want to quickly share with everyone a list of upcoming free digital events here at Cretech. On Thursday, May 21st, Cretech talks tech-enabled capital markets. On Thursday, uh, May 21st, preparing the built world for the new normal uh, presented by OpenPath. On Friday, May 29th, Cretech talks fully automated multifamily. Tuesday, June 9th, uh, we'll be hosting our uh, ever so popular virtual demo day. And in September, on Tuesday, September 15th, we will also be hosting a uh, very popular vir virtual demo day. While we're waiting uh, for everyone to kind of get their seats, uh, I wanted to also quickly discuss, um, for anyone uh, that would like to participate in, in today's conversation, have any questions regarding Q&A, or have any, basically any, uh, any question that would like to ask the panels, please do so by clicking the Q&A button look at the bottom of your page. Throughout today's co conversation, if you are amazing audience and our community have any questions, please engage with us. Please ask our amazing panel some questions. We'd love to kind of hear from you. So don't forget to click that Q&A button on the bottom of your page to submit, start submitting your questions. Um, I see that we have a large crowd already gathering. Um, so let's just kind of get this show on the road here. Without further ado, um, with that said, I see, you know, let's kind of get the show on the road. In the post-pandemic era of commercial real estate, the industrial real estate sector may be the most disrupted yet opportunistic. A true black swan event in modern economic history, today's leaders in industrial real estate are rethinking and transforming their approach and strategies in today's economic environment. From supply chain and logistics to real estate strategies and tech-enabled solutions, it's my pleasure to introduce our amazing expert panelists, Jeff Castleman of CRG, Will O'Donnell of Prologis Ventures, Jay Tedisco of Ware Malcolm, as uh, they share their near and long-term perspectives on the impact of the pandemic and the innovative solutions and technologies they are using to succeed in today's economic environment. Today's session will be moderated by the legendary supply chain and logistics guru, Rich Thompson of JLL. With that said, Rich, my friend, the digital stage is now yours. Hey, Ash, thank you so much. And I wanna thank Creed Tech for inviting me to host this event. Uh, that was quite an introduction. I haven't had something like that in quite a long time, but thanks so much, Ash. I'm very excited to do this because these are hot topics for everybody and we have such a great panelist group here. Uh, what I thought I would do to start would be to ask each of our panelists to provide a brief kind of one to two minute perspective on their experience, uh, their focus on this particular topic so that you understood where they're coming from, okay? Not, you know, where they went to college, but, you know, what, what their sort of lens is on this particular uh, situation that we're in right now. So I'd, I'd actually like to start with Jeff. Jeff, would you uh, share with the group a little bit of your background? Sure. Thank you, uh, Rich, and thank you, Ash, for, for hosting this. Uh, it's great to be here. It's great to see everybody. Um, I, I, what I would say is this. Um, I like to play at the intersection of real estate, technology, and energy. And I've been doing that since about 2004. And between 2004 and now, uh, I've developed a track record in each of those areas and in, in ways where those have been bundled together. So I have real estate interests. I have uh, energy interests. I own an energy country, uh, company that does very well. Um, I have uh, technology interests. I, I'm, I'm an advisory board member uh, to CRE Tech, among others, uh, mentor startups in the prop tech field, uh, invest there uh, as well. 
Uh, and then on the real estate side uh, at CRG, I provide sort of a, a workplace strategy opportunity to our, our national accounts, uh, clients, and platform um, where you can bring all those three things together um, and talk about what the future holds uh, in terms of the built world, in terms of industries, in terms of how people use buildings, space, what, what changes are coming. Uh, and I've been able to supplement that with uh, some interesting things like being the president of SIOR a few years ago, uh, which gives sort of a global perspective and, and help create a real global network of, of connectivity. And, and I also do some public speaking. Um, and so in, in the process of going to some, some really interesting events, uh, outside of real estate even, and talking to those uh, communities or those, those groups about, you know, what the future is and, and why, why it's changing and how it's coming. Um, it's, it's really helped develop my own perspective. So hopefully that's a good intro. Yeah, that's great. All right, Jeff, thanks. That's very helpful. Jay, I'm going to flip over to you now. Can you share some of your background with the groups so they know where you're coming from? Sure. Thanks, Rich. Um, uh, uh, my name is Jay Tedisco. I'm a president of Ware Malcolm Architects. Uh, we're an architectural and engineering firm uh, based in Irvine, California. We have 25 offices all over North America, and our clients are, are developers and end users. And so we, we have a very specific view of the world that comes from both sides of the, of the real estate equation. Uh, our practice is focused on uh, commercial real estate with a, with a real emphasis on industrial. So we really see it from, from both sides. Uh, the, the ability to, you know, uh, land plan a big site uh, to anticipate what the market's going to be in the 5, 10, 15 year planning horizon is really the challenge we have these days because the market evolves quickly and our developer clients, you know, want to know what our end user clients want to build. And so uh, the dynamic of those two places is what, what I do. I'm a land planner. I've been a licensed architect for over 35 years. And so I bring that perspective to the table when I sit with a client. Terrific. And, and Jay, I know you've got like 600 designers working with some of the top firms and, and a lot of your businesses. Ecom will have a great perspective on this discussion. Thank you. And then uh, last but not least, Will, uh, Will, you want to share some of your background with us? Uh, because I know you're with Prologis, you come at it from a unique pers perspective from Prologis. Yeah, no, thank you, Rich, for having me uh, on today, and I appreciate the uh, Cree Tech team especially. Um, so as you said, I'm, I'm with Prologis. Prologis is the largest global owner of logistics real estate. So we own uh, over 950 million square feet of logistics facilities in 19 countries. Let's call it a billion, Will. I, I, I'll round it up to a billion. <laughs> uh, I think we're actually, yeah. So I... I have a unique role within the company. Uh, four years ago, we launched what we call Prologis Ventures, and it's really a focus on how we look outside the company to understand where disruption and change is occurring and how our industry is evolving to be able to bring back and figure out how do we create value for Prologis in new ways, or even more importantly, our customers. Uh, so where, where we're very focused on commercial real estate technology. So how do we improve our core business processes? How do we lease buildings more efficiently? How do we make, enhance our capital employment decisions? Uh, digitization of the supply chain is another big area we're focused on. So how do merging technologies, whether it's 5G or private LTE e networks, impact our buildings? How do we create a digital twin, uh, IoT? And then you think, start thinking is, as Jeff said earlier around energy, there's a massive amount of energy infrastructure needs to be put in place to support EV charging or the emergence uh, and continuing growth of, of solar and renewables and batteries. Um, and then really where we spend a lot of time is on supply chain and, and transportation. So looking at the components of e-commerce with the impact on our customers' business and how they're revamping their supply chains. Looking at predictive inventory analytics, looking at autonomous vehicles, uh, automation within the warehouses, urban fulfillment. So there's a lot of trends that we're spending a lot of time on. Um, and that's really a focus of my group and how as a company do we stay ahead of what's next and bring in that technology. Oh, that's great, Will. And we will tap into that for sure today. Uh, just as a reminder to the, to the group, I'm going to pose a few questions to each of the panelists and, and we're going to get their perspectives on some big questions. And then uh, 
so you're aware as your questions come in, Ash will be keeping track and then we will flip it over to an audience Q&A after I've had a chance to pepper these guys for a little bit, okay? So with that being said, Jeff, I'm gonna pick on you first, okay, if you don't mind. Uh, you know, the pandemic has really taken its toll, especially on some retailers that don't have an e-commerce presence. And, you know, we're all familiar with that. Um, but, you know, retail's decline may come at a gain for industrial, and certainly it has for e-commerce. You know, my understanding is that, you know, the big e-commerce players are, are running at surge volumes that are in excess of that of the holiday season. So, you know, we, we've seen that, we're experiencing that. Can you share some insights on the evolving dynamics of sort of experiential e-commerce and what you're seeing as it regards sort of retail today and the intersection of retail and, and industrial even? Sure, sure. And that's a really, actually a really great place to start. Um, retail was already reeling, right? Before COVID came, uh, some retailers were pivoting uh, to the new digital world, but many weren't or were slow or ineffective in doing so. So retail was already uh, reeling, plus consumer uh, preferences uh, and consumer drivers were changing and it was very hard. They change faster these days, right? Uh, in the digital world. So it's hard for retailers to keep up with all that. And then COVID came and really began uh, to disrupt that by sending the people who are now uh, honoring a stay at home uh, order uh, or a shelter in place order uh, into an online shopping world uh, just so that they can keep their house stocked with toilet paper or, or food or, or whatever it is that they need. So the, the consumers that were already comfortable with e-commerce have doubled down. Their orders are bigger uh, and more frequent as a result of COVID. But uh, folks like perhaps my, my in-laws <laughs> who are in Florida, uh, who never tried e-commerce, couldn't understand the purpose of it, didn't want to try it, was just not on their radar, uh, have turned to it. And I think a whole bunch of folks just like them. Uh, and it turned out, that they had a good experience with it. Uh, they liked it, it was smooth, it was safe. Uh, it got the food or the supplies to their, their little condo and, and they're hooked and now all of a sudden they're like, I get it. And so a whole new group of folks have come into e-commerce uh, and all the e-commerce metrics uh, are through the roof. Uh, what people were liking about retail, the retail that was working pre-COVID was experiential kind of, of retail. Uh, a place where, you know, when I, when I, I talk about this, uh, when I speak, I, I refer to something called DICE, which is, stands for differentiation, uh, inspiration, community, and experience. And if a retailer had all four of those ingredients in their recipe, they were likely to be successful. But that's, it's actually expanded to where uh, anybody dealing in commercial real estate needs to have a very similar recipe, office space, hospitality, travel, even industrial. And, and so the point I want to make on it is um, e-commerce isn't a guarantee of success, even though it's the obvious replacement to some degree for uh, routine retail needs. Uh, the next evolution of e-commerce is what I call experiential because when you think about your experience as a consumer or as a business person with, with, uh, with e-commerce, um, the communications can be experiential. They can be good or bad, right? They can be prompt uh, or, or uh, inconsistent or, or maddeningly frustrating. We've probably all had that experience. The tracking, what do we like about Uber, right? We can see that vehicle on our phone coming from where it was to where we are. Could you imagine when we have that ability, we actually have that ability now, but we don't do it now, uh, to track our package in the same way. Um, the ordering process can be experiential. The return process, really important, because most people are buying more SKUs than they're consuming. So they're buying five and returning two, or buying five and returning three. The last mile, is it touchless? Did a robot bring it? Did a drone bring it? It's experiential. Um, and we're just in the first half of the first inning as far as that goes. Um, if the e-commerce community can grasp onto that concept of experiential and take it to another level, and several are working on it, and I'll bet Will's already talking to a bunch of those companies, not knowing, but I'll bet you are, um, then e-commerce is going to absolutely destroy 
retail as we know it. And retail will still be around when it's safe to come back out again, but it will only exist to be experiential uh, because e-commerce will become too efficient and too engaging through its own experience uh, for retail to really get another foothold. That's, that's my perspective on it. Yeah, that's, uh, go ahead, Will. I was gonna say, I can throw in a couple of data points too that I think would be helpful to uh, what, what Jeff was just saying. Um, what we've done as a company is really looked at different customer segments uh, just to see where the current penetration is. And within electronics and uh, appliances, e-commerce has a 33% share of revenue at the moment. Sporting goods, it's 28%. Uh, diversified real estate, I mean, sorry, diversified retail, it's 27. But where it gets really interesting is when you look at segments such as food and beverage, it's currently 2%. Uh, auto parts are 3%. Construction, home improvement is about 9%. So even though e-commerce has gotten a lot of visibility, there is still a substantial amount of retail that's still done through bricks and mortar. On the flip side, we've also looked at with every 100 basis points of share shift from bricks and mortar to e-commerce, that translates to about 47 million square feet of industrial real estate demand in the US. Um, so as this transition occurs, there's just going to be more and more demand for industrial estate and rejiggering supply chains to support this. Hey, Will, can you repeat that last metric that you yeah. put out there? So, sure. For every 100 basis points of share shift from bricks and mortar to online, that translates to 47 million, uh, 46 million square feet of net demand for industrial uh, real estate in the United I States. I love that. And you guys have been leaders in trying to, you know, kind of connect the dots between the growth of e-commerce and what that means to industrial space. Yep. I think that's a, a terrific metric. You know, I think we'll all agree, uh, as at the end of 2019, e-commerce was 11.1% of total retail sales here in the United States. And so it has a ton of runway. And uh, Jeff, to your point, it's never, it's not going to be 100%. I mean, you're always going to have, you know, traditional retailers and that'll still work. But, uh, but there's a ton of runway. And this pandemic has really just put a big spotlight on e-commerce right now. And it's, uh, and it's growing and it's uh, accelerating. And the adoption rates, to your point about your parents, you know, at their condo, uh, demographics that wouldn't have tried it or trying it, uh, that's for sure. And, and even I'm a first time online grocery guy and I'm, you know, I'm sold on it. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, I want to shift gears. Uh, Jay, I'm going to draw you in here because, you know, um, I hope I'm not sharing secrets, but you said like almost half of your work right now is on the e-commerce side and this is design, architecting buildings. What changes are you seeing in you know, designing industrial distribution and logistics buildings and trends, and even innovations that you're seeing as it relates to the e-commerce piece of that? Well, everything you guys have been talking about for the last few minutes is, uh, has been reflected on our business. And so the, the volume of, of work that we have is, is very stable. Uh, I think that we've seen you know, our share of projects go on hold or, or stop, but those have been certainly supplemented by uh, an increased volume of, of work on the, on the industrial sector. So the e-commerce piece obviously is driving that. And so the, you know, the ability to, for us to, to ramp up to that demand is what, why our clients have been, have been so active. Uh, you mentioned we have 600 employees. We haven't laid a single one off. And so our business is strong. I think that's a good sort of a barometer to the market that the industrial segment is, is being supported with real projects that the data that Jeff and Will, you know, outlined uh, is, is reflecting. So we see an uptick in that. Uh, as far as the as far as the you know trends, I, I would say that you know it depends who we're talking about. If it's a developer kind of a client of ours, you know, the question is mm -hmm. always what kind of a building should we build to attract these these type tenants, right? And that's that's a conversation that's evolved over the last few years based on the on, on what gets leased and what gets bought. But if it's if it's a um, if it's an end user, it's really a different conversation. So I'd say that from a trend standpoint, in the past, uh, on the end user side, if we're talking about highly automated warehouses, um, the, the, the ASRS systems, the automation systems, those integrators would really drive the design of the building. And as a, as a real estate professional design, designer, I would say you, you don't wanna do that. You wanna make buildings that can be really used for second generation. And it's taken a while for my, my user clients to, to see that value. You know, the, the, the buildings are being 
design more mainstream base sizes, clear heights, footprints. They're not they're not unusual L-shaped buildings and odd uh, square footages that we've seen in the past. So I think that's a important trend because these buildings, you know, they, they have to have a life uh, that continue to be uh, evolve as the as the, the market evolves. And so what we see today is is really not what we're going to see in five and ten years. And so those buildings have to be very flexible. So we're moving back to more of a standard speculative building, even on the build a suit side of our business. That, uh, that's very interesting. Um, and I want to pick on you later because, uh, you know, that is a, a big uh, a question that we get from our corporate occupiers, investor developers as well, in terms of how all these changes are going to impact building design. And, and I think the short answer is it depends on what you're trying to do, but I think you pointed out some good things there. Hey, Will, I want to uh, I want to ask you, and this is kind of a big question, but uh, one that I have, you know, what is the overall sentiment of the venture capital world right now as it regards, you know, e-commerce and supply chain? And certainly venture capital has a different set of goggles on these issues than, you know, corporate occupiers. What are the learnings you know that you're picking up and providing to your corporate occupier clients in your industrial buildings and patients are saying because you're on the front edge of that a lot of questions you managed to uh yeah, yeah run. All right, let, let me let me attempt to go systematically through what you just asked um i think starting with the venture capital community um supply chain and logistics is one of those fundamental foundational industries to some degree people don't think about until they do. And I think one of the aspects of COVID, um, it really exposed how important and crucial a resilient and flexible supply chain is to our country. Um, it also is venture capitalists like the, the, the thing about TAM. So it's total addressable market. So how much and how big of an opportunity is this? Something mm -hmm. like trucking, uh, is $750 billion a year is spent on trucking. Uh, so it is a massive industry. I think it's the largest employer in 29 of the 50 states. Uh, so it has huge impact on our economy. Um, so the venture capital community, I think in the last two, three, four years has become much more attuned and a lot of capital has flown into it. Very similar to CRE Tech where property ownership, both on the commercial and residential side, is massive industry that people didn't really think about as much until the emergence started coming in. So um, to your question, I think people are starting to get in this space, but the other aspect is it's very nuanced. So people who have a degree of understanding of the industry, so we've seen a lot of companies that have really interesting technology that's searching for a problem. I think, and, and Jeff, you and I have talked about this a lot, that really it's incumbent on the industry and people who are on this call, people who understand the space, to be able to find their problems in a solvable way and match it with technology. And if you start with what the pain point is and the outcome, that's where a lot of these successful, actually implementable solutions come in. I think as a industry, um, companies where the incumbents are all figuring out how do we survive in the space? How do we put the right organizational structures in place, how do we pull in the right people in order for us to be able to adopt this technology and how do we implement it? So it's, it's a fascinating space because of all the changes that are happening and with the emergence and acceleration of e-commerce, it's putting a lot of pressure on people to adopt. Uh, and because of that, I think venture capitalists are very excited about the opportunities, but there's also a lot of knowledge gathering um, and how do we play, what's important and what's not. And I think, I mean, organizations like Prologis Ventures play an important role because we do have that incumbent understanding of what's needed. We have the platform and the scale to be able to drive change, but at the same time, we're open and, and, and really intellectually curious on what else is out there and how we can look at other industries and what may have been successful there and apply it to ourselves. Um, yeah. Will, you're in a really unique position there, um, and uh, it applies to all of us, right? All the things yeah. that you're looking at, all the, the companies that you look at on a constant basis. Will promised he'd share out his cheat sheet of what to invest in. No, I'm kidding. 
uh, no, thanks, Will. Hey, uh, you know, related, Jeff, back to you for a second, if I could. You know, you kind of touch a lot of different aspects of industrial real estate, but in the capital market side. Um, you know, who do you see as some of the key players in e-commerce moving forward? And can you share some insights on, you know, what you see from an investor, developer, capital par partners, even tech partners perspective? Yeah, sure. There's a lot wrapped up in that question as well, I think. But yeah, another three for, <laughs> for you there. Yeah, yeah let, me, uh, let me do what I can there. Um, Want to run it by me again? What are some yeah, of the sure. players? What, what, some of the players? What, what, are you, what, are you, yeah, what are you saying? The key, who are the key players moving forward, you know, from the, all different sides? Wow. You know, um, e-commerce is like saying the word technology. It's so broad. It covers so much space. Uh, the best way to, to answer the question is to sort of break it into, into smaller bits. Um, mm -hmm. There will be players up and down uh, the e-commerce spectrum from where a, a product is produced to where it's consumed, which in effect defines the supply chain, right? Uh, sometimes I refer to it as uh, the mega mile, right? It's manufactured somewhere, it's brought to a port, it's shipped overseas, that's the mega mile, right? That requires a certain type of facility or a certain type of interaction, and there's players in that space and just in that space. Uh, it arrives at a port, it goes into intermodal, it moves across the country perhaps on a different mode of transport, truck or, or train, right? Um, that's what I call the mid-mile, okay? Then it arrives close to where it's going to be uh, sold or consumed. That's really where the first mile starts. Most people think that's the last mile, and that's actually um, the way I describe it, the first mile, the first part of the last leg. So the first mile. Um, and then the first mile, of course, turns into a last mile delivery. And there's different players at each one of those stages. That's operationally. You also have automation players. You have inventory management players. You have robotics and automation players. You have 3D printing players. You have delivery players. And they just want to focus on the delivery space. You have returns. Really an interesting space. I'll bet it's one that, that will has got to be looking at because there's been an explosion of companies that want to take that returns process out of the hands of the business that's selling the goods and be a third party intermediary in making it a better experience for the consumer and a more profitable segment of the business for the, for the, for the, uh, the seller or the e-commerce operator. So, um, uh, ordering shopping cart technology, um, automation of trucks, all of those places have, three to a hundred new players. How many achieve scale? How many have uh, a cash burn strategy that will withstand COVID? How many can uh, uh, transition from one market to, to global markets remains to be seen. And unfortunately, very few of them will ever uh, achieve that scale. And that's gotta be something that, that uh, is looked at um, when the capital says, let's invest. On the capital side, and this is interesting, because I spent most of my career as a real estate broker uh, and recently went to CRG, uh, which is a developer, and, and CRG uh, is part of a broader empire uh, under the Clayco Enterprise uh, brand. And, and Clayco is a, is a construction company. And, and um, capital, right, is our, is our lifeline. Of course, clients and, and opportunities to build, but, but if we can't finance it, we can't build it. So uh, learning in that segment of the business has really been fascinating for me, especially in, in uh, a black swan event like COVID. Um, and it turns out that the capital has a lot to say about what goes into a building and what doesn't go into a building and why. Uh, so even some of the best ideas, some of the best players that could touch some of these things don't make it into the buildings they get designed or get built. I saw Jay shake his head a little bit, right? Because the capital, either your, your equity partner or your construction loan, your debt, uh, says, I'm not comfortable with that. Uh, it could eat into my return or I'm not comfortable with that. It's not proven. There isn't enough data points. Those are the kinds of things that we hear sometimes. Um, and so the balance for us anyways, is trying to, to cater to the client, uh, bring innovation and future proofing into the conversation and still appease the capital partners. And it's a delicate balance for sure. Hey, Jeff, one of the things you touched on, which I think is really 
interesting and challenging with the um, supply chain logistics is just the intersection of all the different parties. So I think you did a really good job of detailing out the different components. And that's where it's, it's really, what we've learned is it's an ecosystem play um, that each of these parties has to optimize their part of the business, but figure out how to seamlessly interact with others and create visibility on the top line across so we can achieve the vision that you suggested earlier of being able to see in real time where your package is and be able to make decisions. And from a seller standpoint, how to optimize inventory placement, how to optimize the movement. And then even you touched on return logistics. How do you optimize when goods come back to you? I want to, I want to add a couple of points that, that Jeff touched on and, and Will did earlier uh, in, in the, what we're seeing is a really a resurgence in the interest in cooler buildings, temperature buildings. And so yeah, there's definitely. such a low uh, uh, amount of those that are available and it takes so long to get entitled and built. Uh, my developer clients are coming to us and asking us about how we can, how we can reduce the first cost of CapEx and start to spec these buildings. So <clears throat> a couple of years ago, we did a spec building in Dallas that uh, uh, a developer client spec and got leased up very quickly. We had a lot of interest from developers about how that deal was done, and, but it was a capital markets issue so that they just weren't willing to, to, to make a bet on that kind of a building. But then in the last, I'd say the last 60, 80 days, you know, we have had a, a, just a ton of calls from developers wanting to re-engage in that discussion on how we can design buildings on a speculative basis uh, to, to address the, the need for, for cool buildings. And so there's a, there's a real push for that. And obviously dri driven by e-commerce and C19, but I think you're gonna see more and more capital markets acceptance of that model. And those buildings have to get closer in because nobody wants to buy a, a prepared meal from a place that's 50 miles away. And so you're gonna see, I see a smaller, uh, smaller uh, projects uh, closer in that are gonna be a direct relationship to uh, the e-commerce and C19 component. Can I make a comment about that, Rich, before you go to the next? Question, sure, sure, is that sure. okay? Yeah. Um, I sat in on an unrelated uh, webinar yesterday, just as a, as a uh, attendee, and, and I heard something really interesting that I wanna share with everybody, um, or even pose as, as a discussion point, which is uh, we're headed because of COVID and because of all the, the e-commerce dynamics we've already started to talk about um, into a trade-off of, of speed for price. We had been steaming towards an instant gratification, speed at all costs, e-commerce existence. But it seems like with so many people at home, working from home, not straying far from home for a while, probably 12 to 24 months, anybody's guess, but it's probably my best guess, before we're really floating around uh, uh, any sort of uh, uh, geography or, or society that in a way that we used to, uh, would we wait an extra day or two for a lot lower price? Do we really have to have it same day? I don't know that it's going to be both. I think it's going to be one or the other. And I wonder, Jay, if, if you're experienced that rich, you, your clients got to be asking you about that, I think, Will. Uh, that, that speed versus price discussion, I think, is going to amp up from here. Well, you know, I'm just, let me take a quick uh, response to that, Jeff. I, I agree with you. And I, I think in a survey that I saw, it was clear that people were obviously looking to get it as soon as possible. You know, the Amazon effect, meaning, you know, you expect it within two days and sometimes, you know, overnight, but weren't willing to pay for it for same day. And, uh, and so, you know, we'll see where that trade-off comes. But for sure, I, I do believe that there is a trade-off there. But um, without a doubt, Amazon has been the biggest game changer in supply chain in, you know, long, long, long time. And it's- And the it's biggest not, consumer of space. And the biggest Period. consumer of space, yeah. yeah. So uh, it, it, it's an interesting question. Hey, I want to pose one final question before I flip it back to Ash to start to draw questions from, you know, our audience here to, you know, see um, what they have on their minds. But one last question, and this is kind of for all of you, if, if I could, uh, and it has to do with automation. So, you know, Jay, you talked about online grocery and getting closer to your customers. Um, you know, we're hearing a lot about 
the um, you know the labor issues that existed uh, prior to this pandemic, but will continue on. A less reliance on people will be one of the risk mitigation plays. Um, and as technology improves on the automation and robotics side, and the cost comes down and becomes more affordable to companies, um, I just want to get you know kind of a round table perspective. You know, real quick, boom boom. What do you think of that? And how might that change, you know, building design in the future? So I'm going to start with uh, Will, and then Jeff, and then I'll end with Jay. So Will, real quick, automation and robotics. So uh, scenario we spent a lot of time, and I think a couple of ways to think about it. One, automation is not going to replace humans uh, de facto in the near term. And if you look at Amazon's publicly stated that they think like the fully dark store. Uh, a dark, yeah, dark store warehouse is 10 years at least out. Where we're really seeing is it's enhancing the operations and creating a safer environment for workers. Uh, so physical labor and warehouse is a very demanding job. Um, so the automation is improving those repetitive processes, eliminating the need to walk seven to 10 miles a day. How do you make people more efficient and how do you put them in a safer environment? I think the second aspect, which Jay touched on a little bit, but historically when automation is very customized or a building has to be custom built to work around it, it doesn't scale. So what we've seen recently is a lot of the emerging automation is modular and can fit in existing facilities. So that allows the industry to adopt it much quicker because if I'm going to get an infill um, warehouse, chances are the building is going to have some features that aren't modern because it's an older building. So in order to scale and grow it, you really need automation that fits within the environment and not require the environment to adopt to the automation. Great um, point. Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then finally, I, I think that everyone's still experimenting with it. So grocery is something we've talked about. Um, We've spent a lot of time looking at the different grocery chains and they're trying to do back of the store fulfillment. They're doing dark stores. They're doing regional distribution. Uh, in each of these, there's different pros and cons with the business model and unit economics. The technology is starting to emerge, but this is going to be a really big area of focus on how do we take some of the cost inefficiencies out of the model that exists today. So everyone has seen Instacart where you stock the aisles, someone goes and picks it and puts it then into a vehicle. Those are things that automation can fix and improve and everyone's trying to figure out how do we get the right technology and how do we get the right business model. But then key, how do we leverage the real estate in a way, both locationally uh, and then functionally, that really optimizes. Good point. One, Jeff, one, one minute on that if you would too. Sure, sure. Um, uh, first, robotics. Um, I'll go out on the limb and say that if uh, any of our attendees live in a city or a near-in suburb, they will likely experience robotic delivery uh, of an e-commerce product in the next 12 months. Uh, maybe not this month and maybe not this summer, but give it 12 months. Uh, I think that's the, the, the e-commerce touch point on robotics, not that it won't be in a factory or in a warehouse, because it will, uh, but we want touchless. <clears throat> we want safety and confidence that whatever we buy or consume and bring into our, our sterile households um, are in fact safe. And, and uh, the fewer people that touch it along the way, and the more I can prove that to you, the better uh, I'm going to do and the more business you're going to do with me in theory. So that's sort of my take on robotics. Automation is really interesting. It's a scale issue. Um, because if you're a, a multi-billion dollar operator, uh, you don't want to put it here and not there. You want to put it everywhere. You want to roll it out uh, and have consistency uh, across your operation. And that's been a, a, an evasive thing so far. But I'll tell you something, at CRG, we are seeing some activities, real estate built suit activity with companies that focus on automation. So there are some big companies out there that are moving quickly to build that scale and it manifests itself in the form of a built to suit of a new facility to, to generate more automation uh, uh, capability uh, and equipment. Um, so I think that's something that's definitely coming. And you didn't mention 3D printing, but I do think uh, 3D printing uh, is gonna play a part here. And then I think tracking 
from uh, where it's produced to, to where it's consumed, either through blockchain or video 24 seven, and you can watch it. People need the confidence to know it's safe. And there's a whole host of people talking about what those new metrics and those new paradigms and those dy new dynamics are going to be. Because the more we have, the more transparency, visibility, and tracking we have on it through automation, through robotics, through 3D printing, and through any number of other means, uh, the better we're going to feel about consuming whatever it is. So that would be it. Thanks, Jeff. And Jay, you have the final word here, kind of innovation and robotics on building design, what you're saying. Yeah, so, I mean, we're all familiar with the things that, that Will and Jeff talked about, but I've seen uh, some, some new technologies, some emerging technologies. The barrier to entry for a, a medium and a small uh, e-commerce retail or retail period has been the, 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 the cost of the machine. The machine inside the building is $100 million. And so that's where, you know, that, that's limited this, this medium and smaller players. So we're working on a concept now where we've commoditized the machine. So the, the machine is, is uh, uh, developed by, let's call it the developer or the end user in this case. And then uh, a, a retailer can either pay by the case or by the SKU on an individual basis. And so they're not, they don't have that giant CapEx of the machine to, to, to outlay. So I think you're gonna bring a lot more smaller players into the market when we start seeing the, the commoditization of that, of that technology and that automation, because it's just so expensive. And the yeah. building is just a, such a small part of that. It's just all about the automation and, and the big players dominate because of that. So when you, you, we move to more of a cloud sourced uh, ability to pay as you go, again, by the SKU or by the case, you'll see, I think, a, a, a shift in how we how we'll have a lot more uh, smaller players in the e-commerce market. The technology has to be there for it, though. Yep. Thank you for your perspectives on that. Um, at this point in time now, I'd like to flip it to Ash because I know we've had some questions coming in and uh, want to want to make sure we get those answered. So, Ash, you want to help moderate that discussion? Yeah, absolutely. There's actually a lot of questions that came that came in. Uh, first of all, thank you guys very much for uh, for that uh, for sharing your thought leadership on on, on that today. Uh, so let's kind of just dive into this. Um, we'll take it from the top. The first question that came in. Uh, first question from our dear friend Michael Beckerman. Wow. Uh, my, hey. <laughs> Hey, I think he's watching. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Does the fact that every state, city, municipality is opening up differently, does this, does this lack of consistency in how the country is reopening pose even more challenges to each of the participants and their companies? So it's basically yes. everyone's striving to, you know, to uh, uh, open up again. What does open for business mean? Uh, I think the short answer is yes. <laughs> Uh, obviously, if there was a common plan, people could execute against it. When you have complexity, as you described, that um, it makes it more challenging. But as a company, we're taking a very thoughtful global approach and then tweaking it for local municipalities to accommodate what's there. But ultimately, you're putting the safety of your employees and your customers first and use that as a guiding principle. And I think there will be a difference between what companies execute in most cases be between what may be mandated uh, by the state or the municipality. And a companies will probably be more conservative uh, in looking towards the employee safety. It, it's got to be a supply chain nightmare, right? For a supplier because every city is doing it differently. Yeah. Um, I, I can only imagine what that's doing to people's supply chains. There's two schools of thought there. One is that the supply chains have to get smaller um, with more control, more direct control over more of the pieces, right? And that would seem like an obvious thing. But if you go through scenario planning and you try to build a flexible supply chain, maybe the supply chain actually has to get bigger and messier with more components so that you can accomplish more things in more places with more people more often without a whole lot of advance notice because those disruptions are hard to predict. And in, in the case of the question that was asked, Chicago may do it one way and Detroit may do it somebody differently and, and New York may do it differently still. And that's really a challenge. 
for somebody who's trying to give a consistent experience to a consumer. So I'm not sure I've made up my mind yet about those supply chains and, and, and how it's going to go. They're completely going to transform uh, into a more flexible um, scenario planning, flexible uh, 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 means of, of consistent um, experience and delivery. Um, but it still could get skinnier and streamlined at the same time. Um, it, we just want to see how that one, plays out. But that, that, that yeah, goes quick, to the heart of the question, I think. One, one quick point on that. I think as a company, we're looking at it very closely. And I think the, this has exposed the need for resilience within the supply chain, um, which is going to likely require companies to start building back up their inventory stock. Um, and that exactly what you're describing, in order to be flexible, you need more inventory. So part of what we've looked at for every 100 basis points increase in the inventory levels, it's going to translate to 57 million square feet in needs for industrial space to accommodate a more resilient supply chain. Well, I'm going to hang out with you more often. You're full of good news for my world. <laughs> and I appreciate it very, very much. We have another question in from Scott. Um, this has to do with, so we all know that uh, one of some of the largest expenses that all real estate uh, oper owner operators go through are utility expenses. Um, and so Scott's question uh, has to do with utility expenses. Um, the EPA and CDC have new guidelines for water management inside of facilities and potable mechanical systems. Um, how do you guys, so that's a, a specific water question, but how, how do you guys see utilities and, and uh, utility management playing a, a part here? In, uh, in the industrial sector? I'd, I'd say that uh, just on the electrical side of the, the equation, you know, what the explosion of, of electronic electric vehicles yep. that deliver the products, you know, we have to have just a, just a huge amount of uh, power come into these sites. And if you don't have the power, they're gonna pass you over. Yep. Yeah, yeah there's, a, there's a design redundancy there, right? It's almost like, mission critical light or data center light for a lot of the e-commerce operations uh, where they have a backup to the main source of power or they have an alternative source of power. Um, some people have even suggested that we may be heading to a, an era of microgrids where people can simply manufacture and control their own environment uh, as a means of resilience, as Will was pointing out earlier. So could you imagine now a business park developed by CRG or developed by Prologis or whoever it is uh, and maybe there's four buildings in the park and they're all e-commerce operators and they're all feeding energy off of a, of a microgrid, uh, which is power generated on site for use on site. Certainly an interesting thing. I can tell you as the owner of an energy company um, with oil prices at historic lows, energy markets have followed, they've tumbled. And so the power of electricity and the power of natural gas are at or near all time lows. And that's changing the procurement consumption behavior, the procurement and consumption behavior of a lot of these big users. The water's a lot more challenging though, right? Because everybody wants that safety first uh, environment inside of their facilities. Uh, and that's a trickier one. It's one that comes down to new protocols uh, and audits to make sure that there's no slippage uh, and that strict adherence at all times to whatever those new protocols are, are taking place to maintain a safe environment for the workers and for whatever is produced in that environment using that, that water. That's a really hard proposition, but, but an important one. Yeah. Um, so we touched upon um, restaurants and we touched, we touched upon just main street retail, uh, maybe in high street retail to uh, some degree, but what do you, a question came in from David here. Um, uh, what do you think will be the key new uses of restaurants and retail real estate in city centers when inevitably a lot of these businesses um, will not reopen? Um, how do you see that playing a part? And I know, Jeff, you had some comments regarding that. Um, um, you know, Jeff Rich, kind of love to kind of get your thoughts on that um, regarding street retail and city centers. Rich, you want to comment at all about that? You start, Jeff. Okay. Um, I'll just tell you some, some firsthand uh, conversations that I've been having. Um, urban growing, urban farming. You're going to see uh, a real, pardon the pun, a real growth, a, a, a surge of urban growing so that 
uh, when you're walking down the street from work to home and you pass by that empty retail store that has become an urban farming center, whatever you're purchasing was growing two hours ago. It's as safe and as touchless as we can generate. Um, it also provides more resilience in other uh, contingency calamity type planning. So I think you're gonna see a lot of that. I also think, and of course not every retail store or every former restaurant can be that, but you're gonna see more of that for sure. Uh, and then we talk about the last mile uh, and where delivery is initiated and where it goes and whether or not you prefer for a different value proposition to go pick it up. Uh, I do think you're going to see a lot of that last mile uh, pickup and delivery interaction shift to those, those retail stores that are typically very well located and cater to an urban environment. But let's not lose sight of, of the fact that the urban environment's under siege all of a sudden, anywhere. Um, yeah, and just tell uh, what, the city, what happens in the city in the next couple of years, anywhere. Yeah, I agree with that, Jeff. And I was going to answer it by saying, I think, you know, we're going to see a little bit of a fundamental shift here uh, in terms of how people, um, you know, receive their, their groceries. And, and, you know, and I, and I think that Jay, you touched on this earlier, um, given the growth of e-commerce and there's no question about it. You know, if, if we were at 11.1% of total retail sales at the end of last year, it could be as much as 20% this year. And, the, and there's still a lot of runway there. And online grocery was only 3.5% of e-commerce and you know, it's going to grow. There's no question about it. And so, you know, that means that you're going to have more facilities closer to your customers. And so, you know, I just, I feel, I don't, I don't know if that answers the question about what are all these, you know, older restaurants going to do, but there are going to be some that are going to be well suited for, um, you know, automated online grocery facilities and, and other things that, uh, you know, kind of support this fundamental shift to an e-commerce. I, I can add, I can add a little uh, piece on the restaurant side. Uh, we've been contacted by a major celebrity chef and uh, he has an idea that, in his view, that uh, restaurants will never be the same, that 40% of all restaurant business will be takeout uh, or, or uh, curbside pickup. And, and his issue is that the way a commercial kitchen is designed doesn't facilitate pickup or delivery. Right. Two, right. two different lines completely different. So he wants to create a network of, of cloud kitchens, which is a, a fancy way of saying a, com you know, a commissary, and he wants to do these in places like dead retail malls on the end cap or maybe a, a empty restaurant where they have lots of parking close to uh, uh, freeways and, and rooftops and create a, a cloud kitchen where as a restaurateur, I could either have my people there preparing the food to my specs or I could have the employees there preparing the food to my specs. And so he, we're working on the first one now as a, as a prototype uh, and he's going to see this. He wants to roll these all, all across the country. So that there's a shift from, the, the dine-in experience, the more the takeout and, you know, eat at home. You have to sort of segment black iron and not black iron, right? The restaurant and retail are not identical. They tend to be in similar locations, but if you have that exhaust and right uh, infrastructure and cooking infrastructure in place, that's something completely different and, and, and gives you all kinds of design and, and, and operating alternatives that traditional retail space couldn't offer. So I think that'd be really interesting, that idea, Jay. Yeah. I'd like to see it happen. Uh, just to throw in a data point on the e-commerce growth, uh, historically it's been about 100 to 150 basis points a year. Through March through mid-April, it grew by 30%. Uh, so we're projecting it's probably three to 400 basis points of growth this year on e-commerce. Um, and as everyone's talking, it's starting to become habitual. So Jeff, your in-laws down in Florida, probably are going to start using grocery e-commerce a lot more now. And that would yeah. have never happened. Well, and, but it's also a derivative of the, of the, re, of the retail and restaurant business crashing. Yeah. Your hearts have to go out to the restaurant, the restaurant operators. It may not be the same for a long, long, long time, but we as people still need to eat three meals a day. And so what are our alternatives if we're dining at restaurants less, even when they open up 40% capacity restrictions, it won't be the same ambiance. It won't be, we'll have masks, the waiter will have gloves, we'll have disposable plates and it's disposable menus. It, it won't be the same experience. It'll be great to get out for a minute, but the experience of it won't be great. And so I, I'm thinking we're gonna do less of it. And if we do less of it, 
then we're probably doing more delivery, more takeout, and more cooking in our house for a while, for 12 months, 24 months, maybe longer. And so how is all that food going to get to us, right? I think yeah. the, the, the restaurant loss is the wholesale grocer, retail grocer, farmer uh, gain, and, and shift in consumer uh, delivery trends for sure. To actually, uh, another question came in and kind of looped this all together uh, regarding actually grocery. I was, this is actually the second question, but happy we're, we're already talking about this. Uh, is grocery, uh, question from, uh, from Cameron, uh, is grocery home delivery going to increase due to COVID-19? Is this going to accelerate the need for more speculative cold ready buildings? I know, Jay, you mentioned that to accommodate a potential increase in consumer demand. Um, yeah, especially in those uh, transport hubs like DFW area and others. Um, love to kind of get commentary on that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's it's a short answer. I think we've covered a lot of it. It it, it is, and it's it's become people have have realized the convenience of it and look where the grocery chains are going to be investing now and moving for the next six to twelve months is to to make this sustainable. Yeah, and Ash, according, according to our research at GLO, you know, there's about 230 million square feet of cold storage that exists today in the United States, somewhere around that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're estimating that there's a shortage of at least 100 million square feet of cold storage right now. And that doesn't take into consideration this growth of you know, online grocery, which is going to mean, you know, more automated facilities, smaller, closer to the customer. So I, I think you know, the answer, as Will said, is yes. Awesome. Um, so we have another question. Um, El Jefe. Um, <laughs> there's yeah, so much. There is so much talk about the U.S. being impacted by the pandemic far worse economic than other countries. Do the panelists see, actually a few questions came up regarding this. Um, do, do the panelists see logistic growth uh, in some other countries, some other countries accelerating um, more than, than others, i.e. how Germany's economy has suffered less than others? So do you see uh, growth in logistics in other, in other markets? I, I'll, I'll take a first crack at that if yeah, I could. Yeah. Um, you know, listen, uh, you know, JLL, very global company. I'm, I'm uh, traveling all over the world all the time. And, you know, this pandemic has hit everybody pretty equally. You know, I mean, uh, I understand there's more deaths in certain countries and so on. And uh, but I I think the growth of logistics is global. And you know, if you think we have a lack of cold storage here in the United States, you know, to go talk to China or India. Um, and you know, Europe uh, it has a lot of room for growth. E-commerce has you know been adopted a little bit differently in different parts of the world. Uh, but there's still a lot of runway left. So I'm, I'm very bullish on industrial real estate. I'm very bullish on e-commerce. I'm very, you know, bullish on all that's going on right now. It's, uh, it's all good change. Uh, and it's not impacting, in my mind, any one, you know, region of the world a whole lot more differently than any other. Yeah, you know, uh, when I was the, the, the president of SIOR, I spent that year, it was 2017, um, to 2018, and and I spent that year traveling to many places in the world and in the country, um, engaging with uh, either current SIOR communities or future SIOR communities, industrial and office. And here was the consistency, to Rich's point, wherever I went in the world, the conversation was about, the real estate conversation was about Amazon, it was about e-commerce, it was about industrial, it was about supply chain. And it didn't matter if I was in Madrid or Frankfurt or London or Chicago or Toronto or, or LA. It didn't matter. That was the conversation. And uh, of course, I was, I was pleased by it, but, but I didn't expect it at first. And then, you know, you sort of got accustomed to it. More to the point, though, this is a crisis of, of confidence, unprecedented proportions. Our confidence is shaken. Uh, in every respect. And so the, the companies that can calm our, our, our jitters, those that can regain our confidence, and it won't be easy because we're nervous. We're nervous about riding public transportation. We're nervous about going back to the office. We're nervous about eating out. We're nervous about leaving the house. We're nervous. We don't know where the product was before it arrived at our house. Was the Amazon driver a safe Amazon driver? Was he wearing gloves? I don't know right? 
our, our confidence is shaken. And I think if we can't get our confidence uh, back through domestic providers, we'll turn to Germany or we'll turn to Mexico or we'll turn to China or wherever we can regain that confidence in whatever it is that we endeavor to buy or consume. And I think it's, it's really a, a great question because um, it really cuts right to the issue of where do we go next and, and, and why? And I think it's solving that, that lack of confidence that, that opens things back up again. There'll be plenty of domestic companies that do it, but there will be occasions we go outside of our, our own domain to get it. We'll have to. So we have time for one last question. And of course, we're going to have to end it on a real estate tech, prop tech question. Uh, and this question, which is my wheelhouse. Um, so uh, <laughs> the, um, this question came all from William, uh, all the way from London. So thank you, Ooh. William, for, for watching. Love it. Um, where do you see the prop tech sector in six months? What opportunities and threats will emerge? I'm going to open it up a little broader than that. Let's yeah. open up from six to 12 months. And where do we see the opportunities uh, within real estate tech and how it directly impacts e-commerce and, and logistics? Well, yeah, it's a really great question. Uh, six to 12 months. I mean, listen, there's companies like open path or, or Intel glass that already were here and already doing great things whose time may have arrived because they're focused on building safety, building security, touchless entry, all the things that have suddenly become higher priority stuff. Um, so I think that you'll see an explosion of, of companies like that over the next six or 12 months. Some will come together and think more broadly, but, but touchless and safety is a big, big area that you'll see. Another is data visualization and data monetization because we're generating troves. That's understating how much data we're generating, but visualizing it and making it actionable and even monetizing it by licensing it to other people, um, creating marketplaces um, where uh, we can bring the owner of the data with the wannabe consumer of the data together and they can license the data at a price point they set and it can be licensed for a day, a week, a month, a year, forever. The market will, 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 will uh, make itself in a manner of speaking, uh, but there's all kinds of data companies that will create those marketplaces and facilitate the transaction and take a little micro payment each time one occurs. And I think that's another tremendous opportunity. Robotics, automation, all the things we're talking about, you could, you could keep layering it on, but, but those two areas in particular, touchless um, security, um, you know, telehealth, uh, which to me is an extension of that. And then the data visualization, visualization and monetization for sure. Yeah. Will, I know you I'd love to kind of get, Will, Jay, let's kind of get your, your thoughts on this. I know we on our pre-call, we talked a lot about IOT uh, and I know Will, you talked a, a lot about digital twin technology. I won't share my views. I, I'm, I'm very bullish on, on a few of those technologies. I won't share my view though. I'm, um, Cause I, we've had internal conversations about that, but love to kind of get your thoughts regarding that as well. Did they internally tell you your views were wrong or something? Is that why you can't share them? Or? Well, no, but we're here for you guys. <laughs> we're here for you guys. No, I, I just kidding with you. But uh, I, I look at it this: I think what's occurred now is is digitization is going to become more preeminent, and what was going to take five years to occur is now going to occur within six months, and it's going to impact everything and how we do it. So, how do we interact with our customers? How do you lease a building? How do you show a building? When customers come into a building and they're, they're employees, how do you create that safe work environment? How do you give them information that's actionable? Because IoT, just collecting the data, isn't worthwhile unless you actually turn that into an actionable insight. Um, and within supply chain, we've touched on this the whole time, there's so much information, so many different processes, so many companies that have to interact digitization of that information in a consumable format is huge. So for us, we are doubling, tripling down right now on digitization and really have broken it into these segments, how we work and how we interact with our customers and how our customers do business. So for us, I think where you're gonna see the biggest gains in prop tech are companies that actually are attacking the pain point with technology. 
Um, and that's where we've really been investing into, but where the companies are going to differentiate are those that can understand how our customers are feeling, where their pain point is, and actually have a solution. How we as a la landlord need to provide better service, how we start interacting with our customers digitally, and actually have turnkey solutions that can scale that we can implement. Jay, let's kind of get your thoughts on that too. Uh, I, I would say just as a design professional, I see the, the things that Jeff talked about, the touchless technology, that will become the norm, that will become adopted in, in uh, building codes, international building codes. So the, the safety of, 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 of occupants and, and it will just become a norm. I think it will be an extension of what's referred to as well buildings. So it'll just be another component of that. So automatic sanitization, touchless doors, touchless really everything uh, will just become the new norm. That's, uh, love it. Hey, Ash, Rich? one, one uh, comment I have on that uh, is, is uh, first of all, I agree with everybody else, and, and the automation and robotics piece is definitely going to be something that uh, we'll see more and more and more of. We've talked about that. But to the other point, it's not going to eliminate the need for human interaction. And this whole idea about human-centric design, I think, is critically important. You know, for the longest period of time, the entire time that I've been in this industry, you know, working in a distribution center, you know, you, you maybe have a locker, got a microwave, maybe, you, you know, there's Fritos in the, in the vending machine. I mean, it's not, not a really great environment. And I think companies are getting smarter about, you know, focusing in on their labor and resources, but in a way, you know, that they're using technology to do that. And to me, I think, you know, that's going to be one of the big focus areas because if you can't get folks to show up and, and move product through your distribution center, produce it at your manufacturing facility, you know, you're done. And that's what this pandemic has done is it's put a spotlight on people because yep. unlike big disruptors in the past, like tsunamis in Japan or flooding in Thailand that have had an impact on facilities, you know, this pandemic has uh, knocked out people. And so, you know, that's going to be, I think, a key focus area. Very well said, Rich. That's very well said. And uh, I think that's a good place to kind of end it. I know we're seven minutes over, but uh, gentlemen, thanks uh, for, for taking the time today. It uh, really means a lot. Jeff, Will, Jay, Rich, thank you all for sharing your thought leadership. I hope everyone, including our amazing audience and community, had a great time. I certainly did. And Will, I'm never wrong. Um, <laughs> if you have any questions about Cretech or would like to learn more about innovation in real estate, venture capital investment trends in real estate tech, or if you're interested in your own webinar powered by Cretech, please email us at, at research at cretech.com or you can email me at ash, that's A-S-H, at cretech.com. Again, my name is Ash Gonzandia and it was a pleasure to be your host today. Thank you to our amazing audience and our thought leaders today. Thank you guys very, very much. Yeah, thank Thanks, you guys Ash. for this Appreciate up. the opportunity. Absolutely. Thanks, great job. Bye. Have a great weekend.